everybody, just before we start the show, we have a dreadfully exciting announcement to make. That is right. The announcement is there is a new book out from QI Towers, The Mother Firm. Uh, now, if you're familiar with a book that we published a little while ago called Funny You Should Ask Again, which was a book of questions and answers all based on the elves' appearances. We all appear on Zoe Ball's breakfast show on Radio 2. That was a book stuffed with questions and answers. And this new one is the souped up, enlarged, red hot edition, which has even more questions and answers. It is called... 222 QI answers to your quite ingenious questions. All right, you've got any examples of these so called ingenious questions, Andy? I've got so many, Anna. Um, can dogs tell the time? If Rome wasn't built in a day, how long did it take? Why do songs get stuck in my head? Where is last Wednesday? There you go. So, we're not going to tell you the answers to any of those questions that have spouted from listeners and QIL's bizarre minds because you're going to have to go out and get the book to find out. It's peppered with interesting facts throughout as well. It's called 222 QI Answers to Your Quite Ingenious Questions, available in any good bookshop or on the interweb. So do it now. That's right. And in fact, we have another exciting announcement to make, which is that QI, the mother show, is returning today, the day this episode goes out, which is Friday, the 11th of November. QI is coming back to BBC Two at 10 pm. The new series is the letter T. That's right. And of course, if you don't happen to be free tonight at 10 pm, PM, there's this new thing called iPlayer where you can catch up on it. It is based on the research that we churned out over about five months, all of the QILs on everything beginning with T from trash to teeth to tunnels to tits to uh, by the birds obviously uh, to toast uh, it was a really really fun series to do hope you enjoy watching it. Okay and now without further ado on with the show on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Shriver, I'm sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Anna Tashinsky and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that not long after Benjamin Franklin invented the lightning rod, it took off as a fashion. <laughs> a lightning rod's very tall metal object. Yeah, yeah. and very sexy uh, <laughs> when combined with... You could with dance around them, I suppose. Fashion. Ooh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, this was in Paris in 1778. If you were walking the streets of Paris, you would have seen women with lightning rod hats. So <laughs> this is a hat that would have a sort of protruding rod. As far as I can see in the drawings of the time, they might dress that up a bit with a bit of sort of floral Tinsel. stuff going around it. Tinsel. Yeah, something to disguise yeah. it. But what you didn't really disguise was the big chain that came out of the hat that ran to the ground so that should you be struck by lightning, you could then ground the lightning via Brilliant. this big okay. chain. Brilliant. Umbrellas did it as well. So you had an umbrella with a giant <laughs> lightning rod on How top. How long do these women tend to survive during thunderstorms? <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't know. They, they all went out and never came back. <laughs> yeah. The Couldn't interesting thing is, like, was there any use for it, do you think? Mm. Do you think they deliberately had them to try and get the lightning away <laughs> from them. Earth, like, I, no. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> or no. is it just for fashion. Well, I think, you know, if if it functioned yeah. as it was meant to, then yeah, absolutely. They, I think they wanted out, it to function, but definitely. If, yeah. No, hang on. If you were hit by lightning wearing one of these rods, which. No, it, it would work. It would ground it to the ground. It's just. I, I think it, it should work. It just that it, it would probably be too close to you. So uh, you'd die. You would die. Yeah, 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 yeah. If your I, hat yeah. had this and then you had a Faraday cage all the way around you, yeah. then that would save you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've seen the pictures and it didn't. No. Maybe so. maybe your sedan chair was a Faraday yes. sedan chair and then you're laughing. Yeah. I've got to say, I empathize more and more with the French Revolution, hearing what was going on in Paris in the 1780s. <laughs> you know, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. pretty extravagant, outlandish stuff. I, think but, this, I don't think this was to do with Franklin, by the way, but I think it was his specifically the French um, Benjamin Franklin. It was his translator who oh. then turned it. So he was a guy who was a botanist, a physician, um, and he he was called Jacques. And then he has two French names. Let's after have that. a go. Uh, <laughs> Babur de Bourg. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah, looks good to me. Jacques oh. Babur de Bourg, and he <laughs> was a physician, botanist, <laughs> rapper. 
translator. Are you going to do the rest of the podcast? Because <laughs> he was the guy who translated all Franklin's stuff into French, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and because he was friends with Franklin, he was also supposed to go to America and then be kind of a, you know, helping the revolution in okay. a way. But he never went because no one liked him. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, like he like, asked like, the Americans, do you want my help? And they said, we're okay. Well, they, they were between a couple of different people and they he was really brash and pe- people weren't really sure about oh. him. So he never got to do that. That's tragic. Yeah. That is mad. Well, well, but thank yeah. God, because otherwise he yeah, might true. not have designed this um, umbrella. Yeah, and we <laughs> might, and the UK might have still owned America. And uh, <laughs> oh, well, on I, the upside. On, on that, the America Project thing, oh, yeah. I have a fact about George III related oh, to this. Yeah. So the light, okay. And Benjamin Franklin, because they had a disagreement about lightning rods. Right. Yes. Guess who was right, George III or Benjamin Franklin, considering the scientific backgrounds of the two guys? So one of them famously mad. One of them, one of the greatest scientists who's ever lived. Yep. I'm and gonna, a fashionable guy. And a fashionable yes. guy. Yes. Um, I guess you wouldn't be asking us if it wasn't the... No, exactly. Yeah. George III was right in their disagreement. So right. Franklin thought that lightning rod should be incredibly sharp tipped at the top. Okay. Sharp tops. Yeah. Uh, George III said, no, I want blunt ones. And right. he fitted the palace with blunt ones. Uh, and he was right. They are more effective at earthing lightning. Okay. Uh, for the reason that the field above blunt rods is stronger and I think that means it intercepts lightning more. It's, mm. It helps to draw the lightning down. So actually I didn't know that lightning rods were to stop lightning happening. Mm. Not the secondary purpose initially was to ground it, but the mm. primary purpose according to Franklin and his people was stop it happening by this sharp rod attracting this charge so dissipating it before it all built up wow. in the cloud. But it turns out that it's just not nearly big enough a field so it doesn't really matter. Mm. So yeah, George III was right. You can have a knob. <laughs> so another thing about the bulbous versus the spike, right, mm-hmm. is that basically because Benjamin Franklin was, you know, one of the signatories of the uh, the Declaration of Independence, he was like a real patriot and he invented the lightning rod. Basically, this was a symbol of the new country. And so Britain oh. did not like this upstart having its new symbol. And that was another reason why George III said that, that you had to put a knob on every single <laughs> lightning rod in the entire wow. empire. Do you think it was a bit of a sly, you know, Franklin's such a knob kind of gesture? Almost certainly. Really? Almost certainly. Must have yeah, been. definitely that kind yeah, of okay. way. That's a George III there we go. move. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I tell you something about Benjamin Franklin getting in trouble for inventing the lightning rod? So... <laughs> There was an earthquake at Cape Ann, which yeah. is off the coast of Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. And it was soon after the lightning rod was invented. And the pastor who was there was called Reverend Thomas Prince. And he said, the earthquake happened because everyone's been putting up lightning rods. Basically, man has been thwarting God by trying to you know, harness the lightning or channel it. So God has reacted by sending an earthquake. Well, the, his idea was... Since God can't send down lightning bolts to kill us anymore, <laughs> he's going to have to go from below instead. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, you don't, you're not showing much faith in your God. So he'll, be able to, he'll be able to zap wherever he likes. Yeah. Um, but they, people were very anti, weren't they? Uh, because of that, you know, you're trying to prevent God from doing his work. If he wants to strike you with lightning, he should strike you with lightning. Yeah. And um, there was a big push among scientists to try and convert people to it. Uh, there was a guy in Germany called Johann Jakob Hemmer, and he was a big lightning rod advocate in Germany. This is in the 18th century. And he designed like a cross-shaped one, which you can still see on the Mannheim Palace. Oh, yeah. And he had it so that each bit of the cross was detachable, so that whenever lightning struck any bit of the cross and caused a bit of damage, he would then detach it, bring oh. it down to the masses, and put it on display to say, look, the lightning struck this and damaged it, but it didn't damage the building. Building, so it must yeah. work. That's clever. That is good. Because what people That's... thought was that, like um, Andy said, that maybe God was sending down lightning bolts to punish people. Yeah. But the problem is, the tallest building in most towns was a church. Yeah. Whereby the brothels were quite low down. <laughs> <laughs> And so if um, anything got struck by lightning, it usually was a church yeah. and the brothels usually got away scot-free. So no one could really explain what the problem was. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the church's thing was an issue. Like, there's another reason why it's good the lightning rod was invented because the way they repelled lightning before the rod was to ring loads of church bells. Uh-huh. And so yeah. being a bell ringer was an extremely dangerous job. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, they were often hit by lightning. They, I think many of them used to die because you'd be sent up to the church tower to ring the bells when there, the was a, when there was storm. a storm yeah, yeah. yeah when you're most likely to get hit and yeah. there was actually oh, really? it was, in 1769 there was a church in brescia which was storing 100 tons of gunpowder in its vaults for safekeeping and oh, it got struck no. by lightning because of the church spire wow. and it blew up a sixth of the city Three thousand oh. people died oh my god oh. I know. what 
Unbelievable. It has oh just my God. started raining quite hard outside from where we're sitting. Uh oh, you nervous. All this God <laughs> and chat. then you've got a massive spike coming out of your head. <laughs> it's all the fashion, darling. Those, the church bells, they had written on them or, you know, inscribed on them the words Fulgura Frango, meaning I chase lightning. Oh, yeah. wow. And the idea, yeah. I think, was that demons would kind of send down the bolts, like God would send the demons and the bells would scare them away. Yeah. Uh, we have amazing. actually mentioned them before. It's How so interesting, cool. though, that um, they would go and ring the bells during the storms because in my head the the wind <laughs> was kind of doing that anyway oh yeah like i would That's always true. have thought that maybe it's... those big church bells aren't too worried by wind yeah. so much yeah yeah, yeah. And also you can't get a good rhythm going maybe the I wind's very bad at getting exactly getting like the a, right you beat can't, you can't get a canterbury peel vicar <laughs> pleasure going whatever the, whatever <laughs> first canterbury that? pleasure that's a that's yeah, a bell yeah. ringing thing is it right. yeah, reverse yeah. canterbury <laughs> pleasure just sounds like a porn film based around the archbishop of canterbury that's why i didn't oh, say really? it <laughs> that's why i didn't say it because i thought it sounds too weird but i think it's a question from the very earliest qi yeah. episodes right. what you know i was thinking it was what the wife of bath did yeah hey. <laughs> i read that they were also a dated joke there <laughs> <laughs> look if i can't do jokes in the 14th century what jokes can i do <laughs> Um, in the age where lightning rods were becoming fashionable and people were sceptical, yeah. there was one really famous trial. And this was in 1783 in France. And it was a guy who'd installed a lightning rod on his house. He was like an early adopter, like the first person to get an iPhone in the village. <laughs> and the villagers didn't like it. They said, you know, that's God's not going to like that. We didn't like it. We don't believe it works. And he, the alderman told him to remove it. And he hired a lawyer. Uh, and took the old man to court saying, I'm allowed to keep my lightning rod. And they won the case and he was allowed to keep it. And his lawyer was Maximilien Robespierre, the sort of one of the leading figures in the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, um, responsible for a lot of heads getting chopped lots. off. Lots. Yeah. And he made his name in this case as the standout lawyer. Wow. This is 1783. But Basically he didn't electrocute. And he actually saved maybe a lot of lives by defending mm. this guy's lightning yeah, rods yeah. to okay. compensate for the head But you're saying off. he was like a planning dispute lawyer. <laughs> Everyone's got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> he but I didn't lawyer, know but his... he also loved physics. Like he was a yeah. science, he was like one of these, you know, men of the century mm. and he really liked um, science. They called him the barometer when he was younger because he was so good at science. <laughs> That's a cool <laughs> That's name. That's good. I presumably knew what the weather was going to be like. Yeah. Always yeah, under yeah. pressure. Always under pressure. Yeah. yeah. Right. I got another wow. cool nickname for someone, so barometer, oh, Benjamin yeah. Franklin's grandson. Do you know he was called? Uh, <laughs> the, the, the thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning Rod Jr. Was his name okay? What? Lightning Rod yeah, Jr. Lightning Rod Jr. Not but his real name. His uh, nickname. Uh, his nickname. Wait yeah. a minute. He was his grandson, right? Yeah. Okay. So you would think it would be Lightning Rod the Third. Maybe his dad didn't want the Lightning Rod nickname and said, "You know uh, what? Yeah. Let's just hold this mm. for my son." Yes. That's cool. Do, do, do we know why? Does he like lightning rods? Or? No, no, no. He was. A, I think he was a journalist. I think he ran okay. a magazine or a newspaper. Um, I think possibly the nickname was a bit of a slur on him. Oh. Um, but I am oh. I am just riffing Because he attracted mm. controversy. I like that. Mm, could be. Mm. I like that. Could be. Because he always used to sit on the top of people's houses. Mm. Yes, and he had a knob on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hello, everybody. Just wanted to let you know that we are sponsored this week by Babbel. Babbel is perfect if you are thinking of learning a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth language, however many languages you want to learn. This is the place to go to to become an expert in a new language. I went to France earlier in the year and I downloaded Babbel. I just spent my time learning French while I was there. I was able to have little fun moments of communication. I was able to say, c'est passionnant, Ooh. if I wanted to say something was exciting. I was able to say, je suis étudiant, if I was lying that I was a student. So <laughs> there's so much on Babbel and there are so many languages. That's right. And it's absolutely the real deal. So all of their lessons, which are 15 minutes long, are curated and created by over 150 language experts. And to make it even better, right now, Babbel is offering all of our fish listeners three months free with the purchase of a three month subscription. And all you need to do is go to babbel.com slash podcast 22. And if you use the offer code NOFISH, you'll get an extra three months for free. That is absolutely right. Go to babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com 
forward slash podcast 22 and then whack in the offer code no fish and you will get an extra three months free pour yourself une beer and get learning today okay on with the show all's with the show that's 11 <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's time for fact number two, and that is Andy. My fact is that every time the UK delays a decision on expanding Heathrow, the head of Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands sends Heathrow a congratulatory cake to thank them for all the extra custom. <laughs> Ouch. I, I love the way you pronounced Heathrow two different ways there. You I said wanted Heathrow and Heath- then Heathrow. Heathrow. Yeah. It's Heathrow, isn't it? I, had a, I was so worried about how to pronounce Schiphol. <laughs> you know, I forgot how to pronounce Heathrow. This was reported in 2016. And um, so um, Schiphol is the, the main Dutch airport. It's huge. It's really, really massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Heathrow has been having a debate for about 70, 80 years about whether it has a third. <laughs> it's, um, it's insane how long this debate's been going on. Yeah. And, um, third so, runway. The third runway, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so Schiphol keeps sending them cakes. I find this very funny. And they said it was to congratulate Heathrow with the positive advice of the Airports Commission on London Heathrow's third runway. It's sarcastic. It's a sarcasm cake, basically, that they're sending. Okay. What and kind of cake is it? Do we know? Well, the f- they s- they showed a photo of the last one they sent, and it was one of those. It was a slightly fancy, it's you know, beautiful, fake fruity. coffee cake. It looked like a flower, like a la- if you were looking aerial shot over a flower. Okay. It looks very beautiful. <laughs> really? And <healthy>. What are you laughing <laughs> at? Yeah, that's what it is. Like a flower, like a beautiful. It looked like a <laughs> cake you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's different kind of cakes so there, was, yeah it was very pretty yeah. is there any chance we keep delaying this Heathrow runway decision <laughs> because the people at Heathrow love this cake so much? <laughs> it's very possible it well, wouldn't make much less sense than but they've been else. doing it for years in 2016 this year of this article um Heathrow finally sent their own cake back because of the approval of the third runway <laughs> right. um so they said thanks for letting <laughs> us borrow your runway Amsterdam we shouldn't need it much longer and then <laughs> cakes yeah. on the way <laughs> six years ago <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's hubris, soon. I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We haven't quite said this, I don't think, but the reason that they're sending them this cake is because of the lack of this third runway. It means that the planes have to pit stop on a bigger journey yeah. at this airport. So they're bringing them business. Is oh, that right? Do they? Okay. More I didn't go, yeah. know that. I just thought it was maybe people couldn't go to Heathrow, so they were going to Amsterdam instead. But that's not right. <laughs> no, it's, it's a bit. Of, it's a bit of both, basically. It? It's just it's a capacity thing. Heathrow uses about ninety nine percent of its all available capacity, which sounds great, but actually, if there was more space. There would be more flights going through there. So, okay, yeah. yeah. So, the, the, it's definitely an advantage for them. Yes. Yeah. Skipple. Uh, it comes from a word meaning ship hole. Oh. That's where the word comes from. <laughs> that place is a real ship hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason it was called ship hole is because it used to be in the water, Skiphole. Mm. Uh, in, in fact, there was a sea battle there in 1573 where the airport is today. That's so And cool. that's because it's all reclaimed land. Yeah. Um, they basically. They wanted more land. Obviously, it's the Netherlands. There's lots of kind of... Um, the, a lot of the area is below sea level. So they created this massive steam engine and they sucked all of the water away um, to great. give them loads more land. And it was the largest summer. steam engine of all time when it was built. Oh, was that's it? Awesome. The suck yeah. dry the airport? It was named after a guy called Nicholas Creek. Okay. Uh, and okay. it's called the Krikwi engine. And they uh, didn't drain the lake for the airport, did they? They just drained the lake to reclaim the land. To reclaim the land, and it became mm. later on the airport. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's so awesome. It's a really old airport. It's from. Um, yeah. It's been used for civilian aircraft since 1920. Oh, okay, which cool. is very old. Yeah. And um, because of that reclaim thing that James just said, the the runways are 11 feet below sea level. Ah. Yeah. So cool. Uh, when the airline KLM, so that's the Dutch national carrier, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Flagship one. When they turned 100 years old in 2019. It was given a really cool salute, the KLM flight arriving in Edinburgh. Have you seen this before? It's when a plane arrives for a special occasion, it gets a water cannon salute. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it means that, so airports have these huge, powerful water cannons. It's like fire engines, basically, Mm -hmm. or water jets. And they fire them in an arc over the plane as it's arriving or setting off. That feels dangerous to me. I guess, but they used to rain on the yeah. thing, and it's sort of a nice celebratory arch. And it's if a captain is retiring, or if a plane is retiring, or you know, there are all yeah. these nice. occasions where they have a lovely little water cannon. So they wouldn't <laughs> want to do it at the Schiphol Airport, where it's sort of refilling the reservoir. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. yeah. <laughs> there was a thing on um, Schiphol Airport website, which was uh, it was like frequently asked questions and things you might have wondered about. It said. 
you may have noticed a plane on fire while you were taking off from Schiphol, oh. uh, which I would have thought would be so terrifying and they need to make a bigger deal of this. But apparently it's nothing to be scared of. It's what we call our firefly. And it's a plane which they regularly set on fire for the fire department. <laughs> no! Oh. To, okay. They claim it's used by the fire department for training every day. Which I can't believe that they need to come <laughs> no. there every day to re-practice a plane being on fire. Yeah. But there must be different crews from around the country, and how? I mean, how many places in the country are going to have a every day though? You're right. Every yeah. Day, every day. Day. yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. lot. It suggests they're not getting it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do this again tomorrow, guys. <laughs> See a load of clowns with bu- a chain of buckets going to the plane. Yeah. Skipple has. Do you, did you know this? Uh, it's experimenting at the moment with guard pigs. Okay. You guard see this? Pigs. Okay. Yeah. Guarding so, from what? Well, exactly. Uh, so, invasion? <laughs> so they did a terrible quiz. <laughs> I just wanted to, Truffles? I wanted to create a bit of suspense. So last year, Skipple did this experiment with installing pigs around the runways. Real pigs. Real pigs? Yeah. To scare away the geese. Okay. Or, in fact, not to scare away the geese, but to eat the food that the geese love to eat. Okay. Because ah. there sh- there's farming around and they grow sugar beet, and geese love sugar beet. Mm-hmm. And so when they, you know, land there, eat the beet, then they fly off. They might fly into the entrance of a plane. That mm-hmm. creates a big mm-hmm. old problem. Um, and so there's a place called the Bietengoonga Varkens piggery which translates as extraordinary pigs did they uh, give up for the final word we'll give up saying this in our own language yeah. and just go to english god our language is hard <laughs> it's so hard to say it's for piggery <laughs> um yeah but they, they they're a piggery which regularly hires out pigs for various purposes mostly right. to eat stuff uh, which people want eaten and, great uh, gig yeah you I'm, never hear about pig strike with planes, do you? You never do. Never you never do. No, pigs don't fly. They no, don't, no. famously. Um, I've got some cool stuff about airports, which are neither Skiphol or Heathrow. Okay. Um, would you like to hear a fact about moss or golf? Oh, golf, moss, absolutely. Please. Moss, please. I yes. Uh, Wait, no, but you get a vote too. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. There's four of us. Um, Pittsburgh International Airport. They have a place called X Bridge, which is an innovation center. And in there, they have a giant sea moss air purifier, uh, which does all the p- air purification in the whole airport. Cool. So, what you're breathing? It holds 125 gallons of spirulina algae, which is also known as sea moss. And this sea moss takes in the CO2. And it kind of works it through its body and then sends out the oxygen. Oh, clever. Amazing. Isn't that yeah. cool? So, so you're breathing in. The, yeah, the moss has breathed it out. The sea moss has breathed exactly. it out. And breathing it. That's nice. That's awesome. That's that's fil- cool. Yeah, like having a Brita a filter. Huge filter, filter yeah. yeah. That's wicked. Um, golf? The thing Please. is, you know that we have to ask about the golf <laughs> yeah, now. It was a trick question, wasn't it? Yes. It was great. So there's an airport called Don Muang International in Bangkok. It uh-huh. used to be the main airport in Bangkok and, until another one opened quite recently. Uh, but it has a, th- a full golf course between two of its runways. <laughs> so <laughs> you're playing golf and there's planes literally taking oh, off yeah. on your left and on your right. Uh, you have to pass through security before you get to the golf course. So you have to take all your clubs through the metal uh-huh. detectors and stuff like that. Uh, Is there a golf test? As in, I'm bad enough at golf that I can imagine myself accidentally, you know, walloping a seven four seven. Yeah, yeah. hitting it out of the sky. How I, hard are you hitting that ball, though? I argue. <laughs> I don't think you would. If you've never played golf before, you wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> so you have to be good enough to be able to hit it a long way, but bad enough that you hit it in the wrong direction. Mm, but actually, um, one of the people who plays there said, in theory, you could hit one of the aircraft, but it would have to be a very deliberate act. Okay. I bet. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you basically have to turn in a different direction that you're supposed to be playing and just whack the ball at yes. it. Yes. Okay. Um, right. But then it also said, the article I read, that, um, you know, a jet engine it's kind of designed to hit geese and you know birds yeah. and mm. stuff like that so a yeah. little golf ball's not going to hurt it anyway yeah, yeah. right that'll just be crunched up it's point it's a waste of effort andy for you learning how to play golf really well <laughs> moving to bangkok somehow. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah um there's another airport near heathrow called northolt airport yeah. Okay. Uh, North is a very small airport. It's more like an aerodrome really yeah. uh, and they used to have a gasometer um, in front of Northolt Airport, right next to the runway. Gasometer is like a huge sort of cylinder that keep natural gas in. Uh, there was also one right next to Heathrow. 
uh, and people used to use these things to guide their way into Heathrow Airport. And so, one time in 1960, an airplane who thought they were landing in Heathrow accidentally landed <laughs> in Norfolk. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. It's only like a bus ride to get back to Heathrow. So they got off. The passengers got off. They realized very clearly they were in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. So the passengers all got the um, bus back to Heathrow. No problem. Okay. However, it's one thing landing a plane in North Alt Airport. Mm. Another thing taking off because you need a certain length of runway in order to take off. Yeah. And North Alt did not have a long enough oh, runway. No. Oh, God. So there was no way to get the aeroplane out of North Alt Airport. Yeah. Did they still drive it down Oxford Street? Oh, what happened? Uh, what happened? Yeah. Well, what happened was a maintenance team came along. They removed all of the seats, all of the carpet. <sighs> anything in the cabin that they could get rid of pretty much all of the fuel apart from the tiny amount they needed to get back to Heathrow <laughs> and managed to make it just about light enough that it would be able to oh, just about wow. make it that's that great. God, the calculations are extraordinary when it comes to that apparently the captain was immediately fired by Pan Am once he got it back fair. I don't know if that's true um, but probably not fair because it happened two more times after that so that was the what? first time it happened and two times after that aeroplanes oh. landed in Norfolk when they should have landed in Heathrow oh my God. And in the end, what they did was they start, They painted letters on these giant gas canisters. <laughs> yeah, <sense>. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> the NH was um, painted on top of the one next to North Holt and LH was painted on the one next to London Heathrow. Why? I, I why know. Put the H in both. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so stupid, isn't it? They painted one of them blue. And the other yeah. one wasn't painted, please. It feels like you could have done more. Yeah, like, yeah. Put tinsel around it. Yeah. Do anything. <laughs> um, do you know the airport that was the Heathrow before Heathrow? Gatwick. Uh, Croydon? Uh, Croydon, yeah. And Croydon Aerodrome has quite a cool history. So it was the UK's first international airport. It was 1920 until basically Heathrow became the big deal in 1946. Um, and it was like that's really exciting 1920 um, passengers would just come for the sake of seeing it it had a five star restaurant up the viewing tower so that people could sit and watch planes take nice. off 1928 was the world's biggest airport what? Good, old, so cool. good old Croydon and yeah. is it still there in its shape is, it's no, obviously no. not an international airport it yeah. was eventually decommissioned I think it just about went on until the 50s okay, um, wow. but there used to be so many checks if we think it's rough going through security now in the 20s if you went to Croydon airport before you departed you were assessed by a customs officer normal and then you went to an exam hall <laughs> and you were <laughs> in your pants uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you didn't know what any of the questions were going to be um, and you were investigating by the criminal investigation department and then an immigration officer and then a medical officer and then you were weighed oh, wow. and, <laughs> and if they for, the pl for the planes for distribution the planes of weights oh, okay, I've been weighed sense. before getting on a plane before yeah small yeah, planes yeah, I think yeah, yeah. yeah wasn't that where you were told that you had to go to different well, times I, have I ever said this on this no. I'm not sure but yeah I did get a plane once where was it maybe in Hawaii or somewhere or somewhere like that but yeah it was a very small plane and they made me move <laughs> to balance out the aeroplane and I thought that was a bit insulting actually mm. it was only supermodels and children <laughs> wasn't it on the rest of the plane <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in the 16th century, hundreds of lives in Portugal were saved by a special sausage. <laughs> it must have been a very special sausage. So this is 16th century Portugal. The Spanish Inquisition has been going on for a while um, in Spain, especially <laughs> hence the name. Uh, actually began in Italy, um, but it has gotten to Portugal and basically, if you're Jewish or Islamic and you claim to be a Catholic, but you're not really, uh, then they're going to try and find you out and they're going to try and try you and try and burn you even. Um, but one thing that would identify you as a heathen would be a lack of sausages by your front door <laughs> because people used to hang their sausages to dry out. Yeah. Uh, and the sausages would often contain pork. And obviously, if you were Jewish, for instance, then you wouldn't eat pork. So you would not have these sausages. So what can you do? Well, you can get a decoy sausage. <laughs> uh, this is according to a book I was reading called Gastro Obscura. Uh, and they wrote about this thing called an Alhira sausage. And it was made to look exactly like one of these pork sausages, but it was actually made of chicken and bread. Mm. So clever. And so yeah. it was a fake pork sausage and it saved people's lives because the um, Inquisition couldn't find them. 
food wise it must have been a very rough time because because yeah. of these islam and judaism have very strict rules about pork and uh, shellfish and rabbits and other things and so there would be some village feasts in spain and portugal where they would serve up paella 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 mm-hmm. paella and they would add mussels and pork and then they'd watch and see who said, oh, um, I'm, no, I don't want any paella, thank you. And then those people would be on the suspicious right. list yeah. for being inquisited. And it was very... So Jewish people who were the majority of the victims, really, in the Spanish Inquisition, I think, mm-hmm. um, Jewish people did have to practice crypto-Judaism for a very long time, which was concealing... I know it sounds more exciting than it was. They just bought everything with Bitcoin. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So ahead of their time. Um, So, yeah, because a lot of Jews had fled to Portugal from Spain when Mm. they thought the Spanish Inquisition would just stick to its namesake, and then it came to Portugal. Mm. And so they did things like they wrote Hebrew prayers, but in Catholic prayer books, and I think in, you know, the Roman alphabet. And so people wouldn't know. They would observe their, like, Passover and Yom Kippur, but at slightly different days, so people wouldn't catch on. And they, yeah, they all hung these hung these sausages. Yeah. And there was this amazing story that one community was found in Portugal in a little place called Belmonte in 1917, which huh. had kept its faith completely secret since the 1490s. <laughs> wow! Whoa! It's just been crypto Jewish since then. That's like that um, Japanese soldier, isn't it, in the Second World War, yeah. or, yeah. or who kept oh, fighting yeah. until 1975, whenever yeah, yeah. it was. Hiru, yeah. Hiru, something on order. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of it was food related, it meant there was a high proportion of women who appeared before the tribunal in the Spanish Inquisition because, uh-huh. of course, they did a lot of the cooking. Uh, and when you look at the wordings of people being tried, they're quite often active. So it's like, you prepared this food, you know, you lit, lit these candles, you did this. Whereas the men who were tried were often like, you allowed yourself to eat this food. You know what I mean? Oh, like, really? yeah, the temptress. Yeah. It was the apple. It was Eve's apple all over again, wasn't it? Was it was a bit of that, I'm afraid. Well, but- I wonder as well with Jewish, the Jewish tradition of, let's say, children born to be yeah, Jewish. Yeah. It's it's through the bloodline of the mother as well, isn't yeah. it? So I guess they're more prime target as well. That's true. Mm. But uh, a few other things, like basically... Cooking a really big meal on a Friday mm-hmm. uh, was a surefire. Yeah. Right. You must be Jewish. Because of the Sabbath. Because, yeah, you weren't mm. allowed to do it on the Sabbath. So if you, even if you just were hungry. Just hungry. Yeah, just hungry, hungry on a you Friday. You often are. A long working week. I know. And also um, cooking with olive oil. And the reason is that olive oil was a lot more expensive than like lard or pork fat. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously Jewish people couldn't use the lard Mm. or couldn't use the pork fat. So they would use olive oil. And that was supposedly a sign that they were to be tried. Right. So so many rules. Um, Couscous. Couscous was also danger food. Was it? It was seen as being more Islamic. You know, sort of North African grain. Yeah, yeah, Um, Couscous. Yeah, it was introduced by the Moors when it was all the Moorish. Yeah, Yeah. very Um, Moorish. if you refuse to eat a conga eel, trouble. Really? Yep. <laughs> if you, I can't. I can't, I can't Whenever believe. you hear conga eel, you do just <laughs> think of a row of eels. I know. I know. They don't have any legs. How do they do it? Exactly. <laughs> um, refusing to eat a strangled bird. Okay. That was apparently a, si- a worrying sign, or you know, a sign that you might be secretly Jewish, because yeah. apparently there are rules against In the um, Bible. eating st- st- strangled birds. I, I see, didn't, right? Specifically I didn't know strangled. That. Specifically strangled. Really, you could yeah, it could be yeah. decapitated or boiled alive. But yeah, is there? Yeah. There's an old old QI fact, which is quite possibly one of my favourites, which is that. Um, Everybody expected the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. They were required to give you 30 days notice. Was part of the 30 days notice the idea that there's a sort of printed menu of things that you would be expected to... Like, how much did how much did they help out people to... Because, oh. as they say, and I have to say, I don't know much about the Spanish Inquisition, and a lot of what I've read to prepare for this fact has been really kind of like, they were actually really polite. And yes, 5,000 <laughs> people were killed overall, but actually they were dissolved in 1834, which is an incredible incredibly recent time for when I would think about when the Spanish Inquisition was, but it was a period of hundreds of hundreds of years that they yeah, existed for. 5,000 deaths over 400 years. It's um, still a lot. Yeah, it's still a lot, it's, absolutely. It's, but it's, really but it's hard not to know. Yet. The figures are so disputed. Yeah, some people say that, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of well, thousands Well, they would say were they were... And, je- yeah, okay, yeah. yeah all like, the, exactly. So there are lo- it's, it's really hard to know. And yeah. then all the accounts are sort of saying what they didn't want to do was kill you. What they really wanted to do was change your moral compass and make you more Catholic and make you believe more... Reli- like... There's mm-hmm. so much uh, that then say they're really brutal yeah. and then... It's, yeah, I mean, obviously forced, forced conversion and it was also forcing people to leave the country yeah. if they yep. refused to convert yep. and things like this. So They used to have um, 
proper they made a proper big thing of it when they burned people <laughs> yeah. the inquisition they didn't sort of just sort of keep it quiet and no, it wasn't no. just slip it under the carpet no. don't want to make a big deal That's strange it was very attention seeking it was the auto de fe <laughs> Uh, ritual and you and this is when the people who had been sentenced were paraded through town oh, and yeah. you'd go and look and you would book a seat it was announced a month beforehand to give you time to book your spot right. everything was Watch. booked a month beforehand everything was like <laughs> the Inquisition's arriving a month beforehand <laughs> yeah. we're going to kill you uh, a month, yeah, month yeah, yeah. beforehand yeah. the <laughs> people who were accused didn't know until the morning I don't think what they'd been found guilty what their sentence was oh, so I mm. think there were largely three kind of options and you had it revealed by what you were wearing so you'd be given clothes to wear that represented no what way. was going to happen to no. you. So were there sort of betting things on the side where people were trying to guess, you know, prisoner on, number what's three, gonna what's it going to, yeah. Hang on, are you saying they give you, for example, a green cloak, but you don't know what the green cloak means until they announce it? Or do they, you do think, oh no, they give me the green cloak, that's a burning. You know, once you've got the cloak. A yellow hat yeah. is yeah. an admonition or something. They whip the cloak out, or they walk into your cell and they say, oh, what have I got behind my back? And then they whip the cloak out and then you know. <sighs> and it's, um, oh so the first one is the Samara and that's the worst one and it had... Uh, this amazing tunic and then you wear a very very tall hat looks like a dunce's hat <laughs> right. um, it looked really stupid uh, yeah, actually those ones. like the ones they wear in the festivals in Spain right yes the Holy yes. Week ones because they look a bit KKK yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah but they're not and that means you're being burned alive at the stake if it's got dragons and devils and flames on it <sighs> and a picture of you as well they put a little picture of you on your tunic oh that's a nice touch <laughs> isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a bit personalised is that so that you can't like accidentally swap your t tunic for someone else maybe it <laughs> yeah, is. yeah yeah well i don't know how good the pictures were no. someone sewed this on at the last minute so, so that meant you were being burned alive at the stake they had the fuego revolto which was flames pointed downwards oh, yeah. um and that was you didn't get burned at the stake Great. you got strangled beforehand and then burned when you were dead so that's oh. much nicer okay okay yeah i, I think so. that's yeah, preferable yeah I think you've got to be grateful and then you had the san benito which was <laughs> had some red salt tires on it and that just meant you had to do some penance so okay, that's the one that's you're really one. holding oh, out wow. for wow. red salt tires look for the red salt tires it's a big leap salt tire is like a cross right yeah is that it? Red yeah crosses. okay but it's a that is a big yeah it's a big difference between the second best and the first best, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. You don't want exactly. them to be trying to choose between the two of them and going, oh, I've got one of each left. I can't decide. <laughs> oh, wow. God. I didn't know that. It's still kind of going on. It's not the Spanish Inquisition. No. <laughs> um, there was, in 2015, Spain passed a law which was related to the Spanish Inquisition, which I find amazing. Hmm. And hmm. they passed a law saying that people who were descended from um, Sephardic Jews, who were the people who lived yeah, uh, yeah. in Spain and Portugal they could request Spanish nationality if mm. they could prove certain things about their ancestry. Yeah. So, mm. and it was, this was a, a law of atonement, basically, for the expulsion of, uh, of the Jews in the 15th century. If you could prove a family connection with medieval Spain, and if you were competent in Spanish or Ladino, you could come back. <laughs> Ladino. Loads of students applying. <laughs> you are fluent in Ladino, mate. <laughs> I've never heard of Ladino before. Latino lad. <laughs> it's the Judeo-Spanish language. It's an old Spanish wow. language, and it's mostly Gosh, spoken in Israel these days. Right. And it's oh called God. Ladino. I'd never heard of it. So this is your set for anyone listening. Your second route into getting an EU passport, right? <laughs> if you you <laughs> yeah, don't have that Irish connection <laughs> that we're all trying to prove. Absolutely. Brush off your Ladino. If you're yeah. Jewish and you've got yeah. Yeah, and they had 127 thousand people applied wow yeah so it was a big yeah first big task 10 shots of sambuca <laughs> and then you're yeah. in yeah. can i give you some other sausages that were in this book yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. um the cacio cavello della Magrente sounds like the most delicious thing in the world so in the early 20th century if you were an immigrant to america you were allowed to bring cheese in but you weren't allowed to bring meat products but a lot of the people coming from Europe were big fans of salami and other cured right. meats. And so they invented this thing where it was salami hidden inside cheese. Mm. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, crypto salami. Crypto I practice salami. crypto salami eating. <laughs> wow. uh, and another one, this is um, a Finnish sausage called makara, M-A-K-K-A-R-A. -A -A. Uh, and how do you think that's cooked? It's Ooh, an unusual way of cooking. Finnish. Oh, uh, Finland, they have a lot of saunas. You got it. Yes. So really? no way. They have a special soapstone holder, uh, which is like, uh, it's like, 
it's basically a tube that you stick your sausage in yeah. and then you put it on top of the coals in a sauna oh, wow. and then it cooks it up. How I cool is that? The last thing you want though, when you're brilliant. sweltering in a 60 degree sauna is someone to go, all right, boiling hot sausage straight off the sauna coals. Oh, wow. the I, think that's that's great. Great. I think that's so good because you could run around outside with it in the snow. That would be you, nice. What, brenching your sausage? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> plunge it into a snowdrift to cool it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then get to it. That sounds like something from Carry On Finland. Yeah. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey, everybody. This week's episode of Fish is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. Exactly. Now, we know that you may want to hire someone for your small business. And if you do... LinkedIn is the place to go. Yep, LinkedIn is perfect for hiring someone new for your company. The job application process is absolutely... Mwah. And Dan is going to be starting his new job as a comedy chef uh, very soon, <laughs> which he found thanks to LinkedIn. And the good thing is, with LinkedIn, you can do screening questions like, do you ever try and do an Italian accent without fully committing to the bit? You'll be able to add your job and the hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. You'll be able to spread the word that you're hiring. Ooh la la. This sounds incredible, Andy. Oh my gosh. That's right. LinkedIn Jobs is absolutely the place for small businesses to go and find the perfect person for their company. So all you need to do is go to linkedin.com slash fish and you can post your job for free. That's absolutely right. Just go to linkedin.com slash fish and you'll be able to post a job for free. Find exactly the right person for your team. Mamma mia. Yeah. Oh my god, on with the show. On with the show. Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that if you count the number of lemmings at their peak somewhere, and then you go back four years later and you count them again, there will be a thousand times fewer of them. Whoa. Wow, a thousand times fewer. Gosh. Yeah. Well, that to me says that there's going to be a lot of lemmings in the first place. Yeah, how many lemmings? I can't even imagine the, a thousand lemmings. That's wow! You can't even stretch that far. No. Your little imagination. A hundred is yeah. maximum, but that might be the video game. Yeah. That's a tenth of a lemming is also, left when you also, come back. You can't criticize James's imagination. Last week, <laughs> you couldn't imagine a drawer big enough to fit a human skull in. Oh yeah. <laughs> My imagination is too full of lemmings <laughs> to fit anything else. How many lemmings would you have in a group? To match your percentage here? No, it, any number of lemmings. So basically, this <laughs> it is must this, be in the thousands. It could be in the it's thousands. It's in the thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when lemmings are at their peak, I guess they're gonna like lemming communities are gonna peak uh, way, way over a thousand. Um, and then if you come mm. back four years after they've plummeted, exactly four years after that, there'll be a thousand times more again. Okay. Mm. And they have this uh, these amazing population cycles, which some animals have, but they just do it in a much more pronounced and extreme way than others and, and also they're proper mammals right they're actual th like sometimes you might have a load of flies that you get loads mm -hmm. of flies or loads of crickets or something at once but yeah. like to have thousands of mammals yeah is like it's impressive. a lot and to have it that regular literally yeah. every four years um they're like and the, the cicadas of the arctic they are mm. yes mm. indeed and this was we still don't really know why um this happens there's it's kind of the obvious two options of either they um when the lemming numbers go up and up then their predators numbers increase as well because oh, they've yeah. got lots of lemmings to eat so eventually their predator numbers get so high that they they can eat all the lemmings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it's like the opposite thing where the lemmings when there are hardly any of them they have loads to eat because there are hardly any of them and so they eat loads uh, but as their numbers go up and up then they, they don't have as much yeah. food so eventually they suddenly starve to death or that they jump off cliffs or they hold yes. themselves off cliffs. Let's get into it. Sure, That's right. Should we address the elephant in the room straight away? The lemming on the cliff. The lemming on the cliff. <laughs> Christ. Who wants to talk us through that then? Well, that's the theory, isn't it? That lemmings would just follow each other off the cliffs and Commit they would all just... suicide. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... I believed it for a long time when I was a child. Yeah. I think we all did. It is such a gruesome story. And it's so the mass suicide lemming myth from 1958 it's from the disney film white wilderness which won a white BAFTA, wilderness. white sorry won an oscar for best documentary yeah. and um i think we'll all agree after this it should be retracted <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. but, yeah. and i'm afraid jeff the lemming isn't here to accept his award but we've got oh they're not here either. <laughs> oh, oh not them oh no 
<laughs> I love the idea of the, the anti-Oscar awards where it's retracting. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a really fun idea. Yeah. Nominees idea for this year's me. retraction of Best Actor include... That's a lot of people thanking Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to unthank you. You can unthank whoever yeah, you yeah, like yeah. in your yeah. speech. <laughs> so basically what, what we're saying is that Disney made this film called White Wilderness in 1958, which showed the lemmings. It showed hundreds of thousands of lemmings, you know, crowding along and, and them jumping off cliffs to their doom which yep. they were suddenly were they migrating they were trying to migrate the idea, was, the idea yeah. is they're yeah. trying to migrate and they jump into the arctic ocean and, and they all die and they don't know where they're going yeah. and then they, they they drown and then yeah. the truth is that they had they put them on a the disney cinematographers have put them on a turntable yeah, yeah. like a lazy susan yeah yeah revolve them around for a bit and then throw so, them off and the they cliff. revolved them around so it looked like there were loads more this a yeah. species of lemming didn't even migrate so they just had to oh, pretend God. there were loads more and they had uh, the really horrible thing is they bought them from some inuit children they basically oh, took no. some pet hamsters oh. from some children yeah. and threw them off a cliff and just threw them literally off a cliff yeah, yeah. it's and the then... least Dis- if you can think of the least disney act you could do it's probably this after shooting bambi's mum it's this yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we Thank believe God they years, never right? did that. I, <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I'm sure they definitely <laughs> didn't do that. But we believed it for years and years and years, and then suddenly till the eighties. Of- yeah. yeah, yeah, and there was a scat. The Canadian Broadcasting Company did an expose on a 24 year old Disney film. It's so strange. Mm. Yeah, but they called it Cruel Camera, and it was about animal cruelty, basically. Yeah. in films. Yeah, so in the Disney film as well, by the way, they use a species of lemming that you don't find where they were filming it. So it was filmed in Alberta, Canada. It was in Calgary, but they presented that it was being filmed in Lapland. And the lemmings that they got for the filming, which they got north in the Arctic, you don't find them in Lapland. So it's just a completely wrong species anyway in the film. Yeah, and the species they show, they don't um, migrate or anything like that, do they? So That's right. it's completely implausible. Yeah, So they, and Calgary's nowhere near the Arctic Circle. In case you're wondering. Oh, really? So, well, it's, it's, it's near in global <laughs> it's near, terms. It's, but near, uh, it's uh, in the north and the hemisphere. It's certainly <laughs> quite far north. Um, but yeah, you would not find them. But the other there. thing is that people say that the myth comes from Disney. And certainly that didn't hurt the myth. Uh, but the, the myth existed well before that. Oh, did and, it? Oh, right. Yeah. So for a long time, people thought that lemmings jumped off cliffs to kill themselves. And presumably because of these population uh, cycles, they must have thought exactly. that. Exactly. So um, right. there's a book called The Arthur Mee's Children's Encyclopedia, which was first published in 1908. Uh, and it mentions this myth there. And that was one of the most popular kids' books of the time. So it was a thing that people already knew, right. even though it's not true. Uh, but then Disney really, really p- perpetuated that myth. That makes loads of sense because... Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, It'd be a why weird thing would, to why make would up. Disney fabricate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so your director's out there. He's going, why are they not running off the cliff? Let's make them do the yeah. thing that they definitely do because we read it in a book. And then um, it might have been something of like that, yeah. There was a thing that I read that because lemmings can swim. And the problem is, is when they get too, if they go under the water, I think their, their fur takes on too much water and they drown. But they can swim if they don't go fully mm-hmm. under. Yeah. And so the ones that would drown would then later on wash up to shore and people would be like, what are they doing here? And that helped with the myth as well, that maybe they jumped off uh, a cliff and that's why they're in the water at all. Do you think well, there was a moment, I just am trying to imagine being in that film crew, there must have been 20, 30 people there all pushing thousands of lemmings <laughs> off a cliff. Like, well, not some of them are going, this is definitely a good idea. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have signed up for this yeah. internship. Yeah. There, was a, um, there was a bit of a mea culpa from Disney when the expose film came out in 1982 roy roy disney oh, the mm-hmm. son or the i think nephew, nephew right. of walt disney said we may have lost a few lemmings we call him lemming chucker jr these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, just on them swimming and yeah. on them swimming uh in migratory terms yeah. which they do so this was being considered even in the 19th century so i was reading something from uh Popular Science Monthly in 1877, and there was a writer called W. Dupper Crotch. <laughs> <laughs> Who okay. was writing what about was his them? first name? Sorry, W. Uh, unclear what his first name is, but his initial was W, and then Dupper, D U P P A. Yep. Crotch. W. <laughs> Maybe he was called Willie. It could be Willie, Willie Crotch. Dupper Dupper Crotch. Of Willie Dupper Crotch there. <laughs> um, and basically, he was writing about you know the the extraordinary swarms that you got. And, you know, they, they just nothing stops them. Nothing stops this huge horde of lemmings as mm. they proceed. And that some years they were exorcised by the church and there were, <laughs> there were anti-lemming really? prayers, uh, allegedly. And Crotch wrote that, that sometimes so many lemmings took to sea to, to swim to, to new lands that in 1868, 
a ship had sailed for 15 hours through a swarm of lemmings. <laughs> a swarm? <laughs> hey. Imagine that. Wow. Just not as far as the eye can see. Oh, like, my God. Probably... That's amazing. Exaggerated. But he was trying to work out why they were doing this. You know, yeah, what yeah. they... what Because uh-huh. it is true that populations of lemmings, some of them will strike out for a bit of new land mm-hmm. and they might get confused and, and drown. He reckoned, Crotch, this is... He said they maybe were looking for a kind of lemming Atlantis. So that's <laughs> that's somewhere which had sunk into the sea, but mm. had been a landmass that had food on it. Yeah. And that they had oh, the memory has instinctual right. species memory. Amazing. And that that they, they were looking for it and kept trying, you know. That was his theory done, by the way. That, that was his theory. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. And it's, uh, yeah. But like if, if, if uh, you know, swallows fly to, to Africa for the winter. Yeah, no, that does happen. Like, yeah. If, yeah. That, if Africa if, uh, sank, we, would they keep doing would it? Would swallows keep going? Yeah. Where, where, what would they do? Well, we know? spoke about monarch butterflies yeah. and they migrate over a lake. And for no reason at all, they take a, a turn mm, right. and then go out. And it's because supposedly a mountain used to exist there and it doesn't anymore. But in their path, genetically, that's been handed on the map. Yeah. Right. Crazy. Right. How exciting. Lemming Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> no, kill it. Kill the myth now. <laughs> Before someone makes the film. <laughs> I'm on it already. Yeah. Um, did you guys see that really incredible photo which was taken in 2014 uh, in Canada in the Nunavut Territory? And it was of um, a lemming. <laughs> well, yes, I saw hundreds of photos from that <laughs> yeah. specific time and place. Narrow it down. <laughs> Go through your photos in your head. It was right. a snowy owl nest. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't see this. This actually. is insane. Oh, so it's um, basically a snowy owl nest that is lined with over 70 dead lemmings. And wow. it's extraordinary. Oh, my God. And it's la- the lemmings are laid around the nest, all dead. Oh um, they're so just cozy. So cozy. It looks, Andy, not dissimilar to one of the uh, cakes that have been sent over. If you look um, down, it looks like a beautiful flower <laughs> exactly. of dead lemmings. It really does. Like a big furry flower with these, these <laughs> eggs in the middle. I mean, it's an astonishing pattern that wow. they create around it. I mean, it's, there's no, there's no um, planning to the pattern. It's just right. dead lemmings laying down. <laughs> hey, you just... You squash enough dead lemmings together, it looks quite neat because yeah. they're very tightly packed. That's incredible. Yeah. And they obviously they've just got eyes bigger than their stomachs, and it's like obviously a lemming bus period. And the owl is like, "Well, I love eating lemming. I'm just going to pick up as many lemmings as I can but and catch them." Presumably, it insulates the nest that's lovely and warm. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a, it's yeah. like a fur coat, but that you can eat. Yeah. It's like yeah. a fur coat with meat in every yeah. pocket. Totally. Kind of, but it doesn't look tight enough that it's the the birds would benefit from that. To me, when I saw the photo, it, it looks like it's just ringed around. A bit. It's like if yeah. you had insulation in your house, but it was made of sausage rolls. The dream. <laughs> the dream. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> piping huge sausage rolls into your roof space. Oh. Do you know where they live? Lemmings. Yeah. I mean, in up, the clouds. Up, <laughs> up north, yes. They live underground, do they? Yeah. They live, this is really cool. They have these yeah. tunnels, yeah. They, they have these nests, um, which are made of grass and feathers and ox wool, which I didn't know was a thing. I, mean, I guess, of course, it is, you know, discarded wool from an ox. But the young lemming pups, they grow up between the ground and the snow so there's right. the snow layer across everything uh-huh. and there is this because the ground radiates heat yeah. it melts the snow directly above it it's incredible so little gap there's this tiny gap and the lemmings live in that and it's called the subnivian space oh. and they I think live it's there. so cool that, it's that incredible it there's this whole amazing. world and that, this is where the adults live in like yeah. the frozen winter period isn't it running around in this secret world between the snow and the ground so how how thick is the snow above that if you were a human walking across it is it so packed it's quite tightly thick. that and that's kind of the point because they don't hibernate. So when it gets really, really cold, you think a lot of animals would kind of dig a little hole and hibernate, yeah. but yeah. they don't have to because the snow is such a good insulator that, like you say, it's warm enough to melt that little layer. And so they can live in there and run around. That's and they're incredible. Not but I do, maybe one of you guys did more research on this than me. What's the snow resting on? Is it floating? As in, <laughs> the snow, it's it's it it's must like be tunnels, right? Tunnels, yeah. So you would have you would have an arch, oh, which yeah. is where they were. Existing that makes in. more sense than yeah. my a hovering, theory. Like, <laughs> the levitating just, snow. Like, it's resting at two very precarious points, and then like five thousand yeah. miles. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Lemming Atlantis operated. <laughs> Gravity had a different set of rules. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or our website, no such thing as a fish dot 
gmail.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. Do check them out. Also, have a little wander around the website. You'll find interesting things like our new membership club, Club Fish. Very exciting place. It's an exclusive membership area where you get access to all the extra bits of content that we've been making from episodes where we discuss all your facts and all the letters that you've been sending in to us, as well as fun little quizzes that have been devised by James Harkin, things like that. It's really fun. Uh, Do check it out. Otherwise, just come back here because we're going to be back with another episode next week and we'll see you then. Goodbye.